Hello, thank you for joining us for the online message for Vine, Vine Valley United Methodist Church for Sunday, June 13th. I am Pastor Jay Lanny, and I'm so pleased that you decided to click on our link and uh, watch our message this morning. Uh, just a reminder, as always, if you have prayer concerns or joys that you'd like to share with us, uh, you can email them into vinevalleyumc at gmail.com. Um, just wanted to uh, send that reminder. You know, we, we take great pride and consider it a, a privilege and an honor in order to partner with you in prayer, to support you in whatever the uh, need may be, or to celebrate in a joy. So, uh, once again, it's vinevalleyumc at gmail.com, and we'd be happy to, uh, again, join with you in prayer for whatever the need or the celebration might be. Let's get to the form into an attitude of worship. Our centering words. See as God sees. Only then can we see rightly. Love as God loves. And only then can we love with the eyes of our heart enlightened. Come. Walk in the light of faith. We will walk humbly with our God. Come, love in the light of faith. We will love everything the light touches. Come, sing in the light of faith. We will sing praise to our God. Come, live in the light of faith. We will live as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, as a church, our uh, joint you know, concerns are for an end to racism and oppression. You know, we pray for those who are sick and suffering, whether it be from COVID or cancer, or whatever the illness might be. Um, and we also, we hold up those silent prayers the ones in our hearts and our minds that we haven't found the words to utter God help me but he knows so for all of these things as a church we say Lord hear our prayer words of assurance as we allow God to shape the desires of our hearts, we live and move in concert with God's plans. Rejoice that in Christ we have become a new creation and agents to bring forth the reign of God. If you're on our email list, uh, you would have received a bulletin. Um, and here is where we do a uh, verbal passing of the peace. Loving one another as we have been loved by God, let us share words of our love as we pass the peace of Christ together. Peace be with you and also with you. Peace be in our midst. Peace be in our very souls. Peace be the light on our path. Peace be the way of our world. Peace be with you. And also with you. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we hear your words from Scripture being spoken this morning, we ask that you would just open our hearts and our minds Empty of us of ourselves and fill us with your spirit. Get rid of all the distractions and shut out the world and all the things that we had on our minds before we came into this moment. Let our let ourselves be open to your word and to the teachings therein. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
And in the words that Jesus told his friends when they said, Master, teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our, this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Our scriptures this morning are going to start in 1 Samuel. And it's going to be fifteen, chapter 15, verse 34 to uh, sixteen thirteen. Then Samuel went home to Ramah, and Saul returned to his house at Gilbeah of Saul. Samuel never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him. And the Lord was sorry he had ever made Saul king of Israel. Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel said, How can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied. And say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed a purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son, Abinadab, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, This is not the one the Lord has chosen. Then Jesse summoned Shemaiah. But Samuel said, Neither is this one the Lord has chosen. And in the same way, all, of, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, This is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there amongst his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah.
we hear a psalm of David from Psalm 20. In times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. And may he send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. May he remember all your gifts and look favorably upon your burnt offerings. May he grant your heart's desires and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord always and answer all your prayers. Now I know that the Lord rescues his anointed king. He will answer him from his holy heaven and rescue him by his great power. Some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Those nations will fall down and collapse, but we will rise up and stand firm. From 2 Corinthians, this is going to be uh, chapter 5. Verses 6 through 17. So we are always confident. Even though we know as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us, so that you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. And from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, 26 to 34. The parable of the growing seed. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally 
the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of heaven? What story should I use to illustrate it? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all the garden plants. It grows along branches and birds make their nests in its shade. Jesus used similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as much as they could understand. In fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables. But afterward, when he was alone with his apostles, he explained everything to them in great detail. Friends, these are the words of God for the people of God, and they are to be trusted. Thanks be to God. If you would join me in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Good morning. So Israel got what they wanted, what they asked for, a king, King Saul. King Saul fulfilled all the things the Lord said would happen once Israel followed a king instead of the God who had always been with them. Remember when I said, when God decides it's time to make a change, then it's time. Well, in this morning's scripture from Samuel, a change is in the works. God sent Samuel to find a man named Jesse so he could review his sons in order to reveal the next king of Israel. Despite Samuel's concerns about doing so, he is reminded that God is always in control. So he obediently goes and finds Jesse. Once together, Samuel performs a cleansing or purification ritual for Jesse and his sons in order to prepare them to come before the Lord in worship and to offer a sacrifice. I'm guessing that it's here that the phrase, don't judge a book by his cover, probably originated. Samuel was meeting all of Jesse's sons one by one and sizing them up physically. But God does not judge us by our outward preparations, but by the preparations of our hearts. You don't have to be on the cover of a magazine to preach the Word of God, or to study the Word, or share it. None of the outward stuff matters. It's the inside stuff that counts. The what is in your heart. What motivates you on a daily basis to get out of bed and see what the day has in store for you? Where can you shine Christ's light in that new day? Are you disgruntled or are you joy-filled? What is the character of your heart? When we judge based upon appearance, when we judge based upon appearance that society likes, we can miss the opportunity to encounter people and find what their true value truly is. Fortunately, God knows our hearts. He sees our true worth even if it doesn't sparkle like a diamond when held up to the light, 
He knows the gifts we hold, and they are priceless. So here he is, Samuel, and he's introduced to son number one of Jesse. Nope, that's not him. Then son two and three, four, five, six, seven. None of them were the one. So Samuel said, is that all you got? Are these all your sons? Well, he said, no, there's one more. He's out in the field. He's watching the, the sheep and the goats. And, well, we all know what happened. They called for the youngest. And scripture tells us he was dark and handsome and he had beautiful eyes. And God immediately said, that's him. Anoint him. And it was because God knew his heart. He judged him on his faith and his character and not on his appearance. Only God can see us on the inside for what we truly are. While some people are so concerned about how they will appear to the world and they might spend hours preparing themselves before they leave the house. How great would it be if they spent that much time polishing up what's on the inside? To create what no one but God will ever truly see. A righteous heart committed to Jesus. That was the heart of Jesse's youngest son, David. That David. David the king, David the psalmist, David the giant slayer. It was here that Samuel anointed And this anointing was not done publicly, but rather privately, as Saul was still king. But David was being prepared for his role yet to come. That, that olive oil used to anoint David was a symbol of holiness. It was used as a means of setting someone or something apart for God's service, and that's what they were doing with David. Although God rejected Saul's reign as king, he allowed Saul to sit the throne until his death. This would be when David would take his position as king. Now a reflection on Psalm 20, which was a psalm of David, from the New Living Translation. This was a praise to God after winning a victory in battle. When God answers our prayers, we must face, and we must quickly, no, when, excuse me, when God answers our prayers, we must quickly and openly thank him for his help. There are many battles we face in life. Throughout history, nations have boasted over their power, but great power does not last. Nations have risen only to vanish into dust. David understood and knew the secret to true power to the nation Israel was not weaponry, but worship. Not depending upon firepower, but God's power. For it is God alone who can persevere, not just an individual, but an entire nation. Be sure to be confident that it is God alone that gives us our final eternal victory. Last week you heard me repeat, as Paul mentioned, that when the time comes and we collapse this tent that we're in, our human bodies. We will receive our new resurrected perfect bodies that will go on for all of eternity. Yet this morning's scriptures remind us that while we are still in these tents, we have not completed our journey. We're not home yet. So we've traversed this thing called life, doing the very best that we can, and 
what we call faith of the unseen. We travel faithfully and righteously to ensure our place in the next life. The unknown future can be somewhat of a scary thing and having loved ones leave us or us leaving loved ones hurts deeply for those who are left behind. For the departed, they're at home with the Lord, they're at peace and they're whole once again. So we can share in the confidence of Paul in eternal life. Because death is only a prelude to the eternity we have ahead of us with God, our Heavenly Father. This is why we walk faithfully in service to Christ. Because even the faithful will have to stand judgment before Jesus when we've been called home. That judgment will determine what we are entrusted with in the afterlife. So care for what you've been assigned and led to accomplish for God's glory while you're here on earth. Because being saved does not free us from the requirement of faithful obedience. As it states in 2 Corinthians 1.10, we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Having a fearful obedience does not mean we're afraid to do anything because God's always watching. Rather, it should inspire us to good deeds, those actions of the heart, as they relate to the words of God, those things that are pleasing to God. And knowing and trusting that God is for us can keep us from earthly fears. Because there is a mighty God on our side who loves us, who looks out and protects his children. And knowing that provides that comfort and courage when we face the trials and troubles of life. We are God's ambassadors. And I warn you, be wary of those who boast about having a spectacular ministry rather than a sincere heart. For those are the false preachers. The one only concerned about getting ahead in the world, those who preach for money and popularity rather than preaching out of concern for the eternity of others. I laughed when I, when I wrote that. I was like, they preach for money and popularity. Where are they preaching? But anyway, everything that Paul and his travel mates did was for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. It was God who mo motivated them, but Christ's love that controlled them. By control, I mean that it was the love of Christ that guided their direction, their actions, and their words. They mirrored Christ at every opportunity. Their ultimate mission was to be like Christ. Our ultimate goal is to be like Christ. As Jesus died for us, we must die to our old selves when we accept a relationship with the Savior. We're called to no longer live to please only ourselves, but to please Jesus for the price he paid for us. A price we can never repay. At conversion, we are new creations in Christ, not reformed, not rehabilitated, not re-educated. We are recreated. Amen? The old has passed away, and a new life has begun. We embark on a new journey in a vital union with Jesus Christ. We are brand new on the inside, as the Holy Spirit has given us new life. 
And all of this comes about because we decided to have faith in Jesus from Nazareth. As being the Son of God, come down from heaven to be the Savior of mankind from the sinful ways of the world. By dying on a cross and rising from the grave three days later. All this sounds easy to us as believers because that's why we're here. We're here because we believe. We've heard a message somewhere that made us want more. What about a new person hearing a message for the first time? Is it really comprehensible? Jesus died for them so they could have forgiveness of sins. That sounds really great, doesn't it? That would get someone's attention. He died to pay the price for our transgressions. Wow, I want to know more about that Jesus. Oh, and he rose from the grave on the third day. Wait, what? You see, all these things were written so that we who come after might have the written recordings of these things so that we might know and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior for all who believe. So even if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, like we hear about in Scripture, just the tiniest amount of a new believer faith, you can move mountains. You can change lives. You can save souls for an eternity just by telling someone about what you know about Jesus. Your heart will see the truth and tell the story as it is written on your heart. Like the parable we heard in verses 26 to 29, when God promises that his harvest will be magnificent. So even if your efforts come from the faith the size of a mustard seed, God's word is powerful. And you can do miraculous things with the smallest but most sincerest of efforts. Just as this, <coughs> excuse me. Just as the mustard seed is the smallest amongst the seeds, it produces one of the largest of all the garden plants, where it creates homes and shelter for birds that make nests in its long, outstretched branches. Something grand and strong comes from something so small and so new. When you ask Christ into your life, you open the door to being a new creation. You begin to see with your heart, as Jesus would have you see. The possibilities become endless. When your heart is in tune, the desires of your hearts change. And that is when God will fulfill your heart's desire. Amen. So friends, as we go our ways this week, see with your heart. See with the heart of Christ. See and feel the love that can radiate when your heart is focused in the right direction. So I bid you, go forth to proclaim the good news that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. As seeds planted by God, we go to spread God's gifts of love and hope. Go forth to live the good news that we live in a time of new beginnings. As plantings of the Lord, we go to share God's gifts of mercy and of grace. And all God's people did say, Amen.